Welcome, Cliff. I'm so glad you're Thank here. You. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Cliff Tisdale is a painter and visual artist. He's done many other talks. This is our third, fourth, fifth, sixth. I don't even know how many we've I, had. I don't remember. We've lost count because he's so terrific and he's such a great lecturer. Anyway, he's done all these wonderful lectures. Go back on our website. You can see, the, <laughs> see and listen to all of them. So please welcome Cliff Tisdale. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Joan. I just want, first of all, just thank you for having me as always. Thrilled. Uh, sharing some, some thoughts on the arts. Yeah. Today, um, we're going to be talking about uh, four artists, actually. And these artists are from very diverse backgrounds, and they did not fit into the mainstream art scene. Uh, we're going to start going all the way back to the 1930s, 20s and 30s, and moving right up until the 60s and 70s. The four artists I'm going to be talking about today, the upper left going clockwise, <clears throat> on the upper left is the photographer Ming Smith. Then the second portion of this talk is going to be featuring the great Japanese American artist Isamu Noguchi. And then on the lower right there is a controversial well, actually, the, the, the third part of this talk, the third chapter, is going to be talking about two Native American painters. The, um, the painter on the left bottom is T.C. Cannon, and the painter on the right is Fritz Scholder. This is a very controversial story, very controversial chapter in American art history, and I'm going to try to tell it as objectively as I can. And I say that partially because I did want to mention quickly that uh, among uh, the attendees today at, at this presentation is Ms. Uh, Ruth Rosenberg. And uh, Ms. Rosenberg has worked at the National Museum of the American Indian in Manhattan for many years. And I was privileged to um, hear her talk on uh, an exhibit they had on TC Cannon in 2019. And it was really her insight and enthusiasm and passion about TC Cannon's story that really opened up my eyes to this amazing story that I'm going to share with you today. And um, so, Ruth, welcome if you're with us today. And, and, and please, I, I, I hope I uh, get this right. And feel free to add any comments. I would appreciate it. So I'm going to get started talking about Ming Smith. Um, let me just... Uh, <clears throat> Ming Smith was born in Detroit, and she was raised in Columbus, Ohio. Her father was a practicing pharmacist, and he was also a painter and a photographer. And that's probably uh, Ms. Smith's earliest influence uh, in getting in touch with the arts. She was given a camera, I think, when she was like 12 years old. And she always felt very comfortable with it. However, as a young woman, her initial ambition was to become a doctor, in her words, in order to help people. Um, but in... After graduating from Howard University uh, in 1970 or 1971, Ms. Smith makes her way to New York City. And she, it, it appears that she didn't have a real sharp idea of exactly what she wanted to do. She knew she wanted to be involved in the New York art scene. And that was probably going to be photography because that was the medium that she was most interested in. This is the photograph she took in Manhattan in 1971. It's called America Seen Through the Stars and Stripes. And it's a good example of her work from this period when she first got to New York City, where she's experimenting with focus, double exposures, collage. In some of her photographs, her prints, these are gelatin prints. She actually adds uh, color using dyes and paints. And also, one of the things you can't see from this digital image you're looking at, but um, 
Ms. Smith was also experimenting with size, scale. So these are not a small photograph that you might uh, be used to. These are large scale art prints. A photograph like this might be uh, like 19 inches wide. So there, she's, uh, photographers at the time were trying to get a format that was closer to painting. So at this point, uh, a friend, she's, Miss Smith is struggling making it with her photography. Uh, and a friend recommends that she try modeling. And she quickly gets accepted in the modeling world in New York and becomes a very successful high fashion model. This is a, a, one of the photographs taken of her uh, shoot. Uh, and she's quickly making more money as a fashion model. Uh, as, as she says, she could make as much in one hour as her father could make in a week working as a pharmacist. And she's able to sustain herself by her work as a fashion model, but still is committed to pursuing a career as a professional photographer. Um, this is an early photograph, again, around 1971, taken by Miss uh, Smith. And uh, at this point, she's, she, uh, in her words, she felt invisible as a black woman photographer in New York. She, it wasn't that even that she was, her work was being rejected with criticism, she wasn't even taken seriously and would be dismissed. Her, she, if she tried to show her work to a gallery, they really did not think, how could a black woman be a serious photographer? And it was a tremendously frustrating period for her. She uses the metaphor from Ralph Ellison and says she felt invisible as a black woman photographer at the time. Um, this is a, uh, again, this photograph is called Brown Skinned Model and Steeple. And it's a good example, again, of uh, Miss Smith's experimentation with double exposures. And it also refers to her profession as a model at this point. And one more thing I want to say here quickly. She actually has her first uh, show, if you can call it that, part of a group show at a hair salon on 57th Street and 5th Avenue. Um, it was a venue where that they were showing black artists at the time. And this is where she meets this woman. I don't know if anybody, I, I, unfortunately, this is the limitation of Zoom, but um, I don't know if anybody recognizes this photograph, this young woman. But this is a young Grace Jones. And at this period, uh, in the early 1970s, Miss Smith meets Miss Jones. This is a picture she took of her here. And they become friends and they begin to discuss and share their thoughts and feelings on what it's like to be a young black woman, uh, both coming from essentially Jim Crow type environments and trying to establish themselves in the arts in New York. And of course, you know that Grace Jones went on to become one of the biggest uh, uh, in, in performance and music. <clears throat> and still is. Uh, so one of the things, fortunately, that happens for Miss Smith, she gets accepted in 1975, and she becomes the first female member of a black uh, photography collective called the Kamani Workshop. And uh, it's because of this group of people that group of photographers that she gets emotional and professional uh, support and guidance. And they start including her in some group shows in Harlem and limited venues that were available to them at the time. And uh, this is really the emotional crutch for uh, Miss Smith at the time and a pivotal uh, event for her, pivotal experience for her. So she starts to gain confidence as a uh, photographer. And uh, it's, here again is an, an example of her work from that period. Um, this is called Beauty at Coney Island. 
Uh, this was done around 1974. And one of the subtexts in Miss Smith's work is trying to uh, counteract the cultural stereotypes of, of Black Americans. And many of her photographs are uh, about trying to show uh, the dignity uh, and beauty of her people. Uh, so this is the kind of work she's doing. And again, basically indifference to the work. She's still starving as a photographer, surviving as a model. Now that changes in 1978. <clears throat> um, photographers are starting to have success at the Museum of Modern Art. They're being taken seriously there as fine artists. Because even into the late 1970s, photography, it's still controversial whether photography is an artistic medium that's equal to painting and sculpture. And this ground, this whole area, there were certain groundbreakers, including uh, Diane Arbus, uh, whose work was exhibited and purchased by Museum of Modern Art in the late 60s. And so in 1978, uh, Ms. Smith approaches MoMA with her portfolio. She shows up there with her portfolio appointment. And uh, the story goes that the receptionist thought that Ms. Smith was a messenger or a courier, just dropping the work off for the, for the artist. And this was typical, of course, of the discrimination that uh, Smith faced at the time. But um, she leaves the portfolio and she is called back by one of the curators and they are interested in her work. So she goes back for a second meeting. And again, as the story goes, she's offered um, a sum for a few of her photographs that Mom is considering purchasing for their permanent collection. And the sum is so low that Smith is offered that she's insulted by the offer and refuses it. The curator is shocked that she's turning down this offer that she knows will change the career, the path of any artist to, to have that honor of having their work accepted by MoMA. So she basically says to Smith, look, this is a very big decision for you. Think about it carefully over the weekend, get back to me next week and let me know what your final decision is. Unfortunately, I don't know if, uh, Smith spoke to her friends and family, whatever occurred, she does come back the following week and accepts the offer and becomes the first, uh, I don't know if she was the first, she wasn't the first woman, but she was the first black woman photographer to have her work uh, purchased by the Museum of Modern Art for their permanent collection. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this particular photograph here is uh, I'm just trying to look at the name here. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's uh, David Murray, the saxophonist. David Murray in the wings was one of the photographs that MoMA purchased. And you can see here, this is one of these examples where Miss Smith was experimenting with tinting, hand tinting these gelatin prints with dyes. Now this photograph, which you, I'm sure are having trouble seeing, is um, that's intentional by Miss Smith. In this, she did a very important series of photographs uh, based on Ralph Ellison's, again, his book, The Invisible Man, a metaphor that she related to. And she did an extensive series of photographs of Black Americans that are photographed in a very soft focus, in deep shadow, barely visible at times, with the, again, the message that that's how she felt and that's how many Black Americans felt in, her, in, in our culture at that time. Um, another important series she did was, uh, this is a, a really, uh, this is one of these photographs. It's, uh, she went, she took a Greyhound bus to uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and she went to the Hill District where August Wilson had grown up, and where Wilson had really, uh, the area that Wilson, that Wilson had based all of his characters in his plays, 
that he grew up with, uh, were from the Hill District in Pittsburgh. And Smith took a bus out there and spent time photographing people, characters that reminded her of uh, her own upbringing in the Midwest, the, the middle class black community that she grew up in. So it's another important series by Smith. And I'm gonna end this segment of the talk uh, with this photograph done in, uh, I believe, 1985. Uh, yeah, that, that Miss Smith took in Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Georgia. And it's, it's called family, uh, family, family Free Time in the Park. And again, it's another one of these examples where Smith is trying to show the solidarity, the solidarity of the family unit, um, how black American families really cling together against external odds, adversity, framed by these two concrete pillars here in this photograph. It, uh, interestingly, just a footnote on this photograph, as I said, it was taken around 1985, Atlanta, in the two or three years prior to that, had experienced a hor hor horrendous uh, spree of killings of, uh, of, of blacks in Atlanta, primarily uh, children, boys. Um, and uh, so by the mid 80s, uh, black families from Atlanta were still reeling from that horror and uh, recovering from it. So I'm going to move on now to the, the second artist featured today, Isama Noguchi. And this is a photograph of uh, Mr. Noguchi when he was in his 20s. Uh, Mr. Noguchi was born in Los Angeles. He, uh, his mother was Irish American. His father was Japanese, but he never, he didn't, well, he didn't meet his father until he was in his 20s, actually. His father left home to return to Japan and pursue a career as a writer and poet uh, before uh, Isamu was born. So he was raised uh, by his mother, <clears throat> Leonie Gilmore. Um, he also uh, had a sister, uh, Ailes. Gilmore, a, a half-sister, um, father unknown, and uh, he spent his early he spent his early years in Los Angeles. Then the mother moved the family, the two children, back to Japan to be with the father. But he was he wasn't in the picture anymore. But they did move back to Japan. They spent several years there, and uh, when Noguchi was in his teens. His mother sent him back to a boarding school uh, in Indiana, uh, a high school that she had heard about uh, as a very progressive that focused on the arts. And she actually shipped him back alone. And he traveled from Japan to the school by ship and train. And uh, his mother would, would join him later on. Um, we see here, I just, I, I just want to say here quickly, just like uh, Ming Smith, when Noguchi was trying to make it as a, a modern sculptor, an abstract sculptor in New York in the late 1920s, after studying in Paris, which I don't have time to go into all this today, but when he comes to New York in the late 1920s to make it as a modern sculptor, he finds it impossible. And uh, he can't sell his work, he can't get his work shown. So he also has to find a way to make money with his art in order to survive. And he does it by taking on these commissions, these portrait commissions of New Yorkers. He's working on one here. Uh, and by the way, this is a photograph of his mother, Leonia, and his sister, Ailes. And Ailes would go on to become a, uh, modern dancer. You could do a whole talk just on his mother, by the way. An amazing woman, uh, not to use the cliche, free spirit and ahead of her time, but she was. 
So one of the commissions, early commissions that Noguchi gets is from this young artist in New York, a young Martha Graham, who at the time is working out of a small studio apartment in Carnegie Hall. And uh, I will just interject this quickly, just as a personal note. I had the privilege of working at Carnegie Hall for a few years, and uh, I was amazed to find out that the whole fifth floor of the building, the top floor at one time, was full of artists living in these studio apartments, and not only including Miss Graham, but Marlon Brando's apartment. It went on and on and on. It's an amazing place. But at any rate, he gets this commission uh, from Graham to do her portrait. We see it here in clay. This is... Uh, a young Martha Graham here, one of the first modern uh, dancers and choreographers in New York. And uh, they build a relationship. And part of the re and, and what happens is, I'm trying to move along here, uh, Graham hires Noguchi for their first collaboration in theater. And this is something very new, uh, experimenting with a sculptor to, to do set design for modern dance production. Um, and this probably came up by, uh, into being partially because of uh, Noguchi's half-sister, Elle, seen here. Elle, as it turns out, not only was an early modern dancer in New York, but she actually wound up being one of the first dancers in Martha Graham's company, which started in 19, 1926 or 1927. So surely there was an influence going on. Ailes was, was helping her brother to some, capacity, some extent here. Um, and so Graham and Noguchi uh, start working on their first collaboration. Now, just as a uh, a footnote, this is an important note to this development in Noguchi's career. This is a, a, sculpt, a sculpture that Noguchi did in 1932 called Miss Expanding Universe. And it was inspired by his discussions with his friend Buckminster Fuller uh, regarding new theories in science and physics that were like, focused on an expanding universe versus a static universe. And, this was a figurative interpretation of this theme that Noguchi developed in aluminum. And uh, again, this was one of these pieces that Noguchi was desperately trying to get shown in New York at the time and couldn't get anybody to pay any attention to it. One person did pay attention to it. This is a very interesting development. This uh, modern dance here, is uh, by another uh, modern dance, a, a modern dancer and a choreographer working out of Chicago, Ruth Page. Ruth Page is less known than Martha Graham, but she was the one that in 1932 saw Noguchi's sculpture, this expanding universe, and was inspired enough by it to write one of her first modern dances around that theme, which would be developed into the expanding universe. And one of the interesting things about that production is that you see the garment that uh, Ms. Page is wearing here, this uh, baggy wool jersey, was something that was, had never been seen on the stage before in my, or in, in, in dance or in modern dance. And this apparently was a collaboration of Noguchi, again, and his sister, Ailes, who had some collaborate on him with the design of this garment. And this look for a uh, modern uh, garment for, for dancers would become very, very important to many uh, choreographers. By the way, there is footage on YouTube of the early production by Ruth Page uh, the Expanding Universe. I think they have the earliest version, I think it's like 1937, but it's really worth looking at if you have a minute and you're interested. But at any rate, in 1934, 
Noguchi and Graham start working on their first collaboration together, and that results in a groundbreaking modern dance called Frontier. And uh, this is the photograph from that first production, uh, uh, which debuted in New York at the Guild Theater in 1935. And this uh, was something that even sophisticated New Yorkers had never seen or heard anything like this uh, dance. And Noguchi here is doing something groundbreaking. He's interpreting set design uh, not as static background objects, but as sculptural uh, objects that are part of Miss Graham's dance. She interacts with his objects throughout the production. Uh, and uh, the way that he's, through his uh, Eastern sensibilities, has been able to reduce iconic elements of the American West into a few lines uh, is, is, is visually startling and was at the time, I think it still is. And you can see here how Graham is actually using this uh, element again as part of, part of her dance. And this is another photograph from this production with another one of these sculptural objects developed by Noguchi where Graham is totally part of this, of this object. And um, this was groundbreaking. Again, I can't say that enough. And you can go on YouTube and see footage of, these, of this uh, early production as well. And of course, uh, the contemporary version of Martha Graham's company is still doing this production. And I think it's still impactful. It, it, it's one of the, a piece of art that reaches that rare classification of classic that seems to be timeless. So another aspect of Noguchi's struggles as a, as a part of the minority population, being a Japanese American in 1941 after Pearl Harbor is bombed, uh, as early as 1942, as you probably all know, Japanese Americans in California start being deported uh, to detention camps in the deserts, the California desert and the Arizona desert. They're forced out of their homes, they're forced to leave their belongings behind, and they um, are essentially prisoners in these camps. Noguchi, uh, at this point, he's already politically aware, um, but at this point, he becomes a, an activist in this development in American history. And he willingly commits himself to one of these Japanese internment camps, pictured here, is the posting camp in the middle of the Arizona desert. He willingly commits himself into this camp as a, an act of political protest. And he also has a, a hope at the time that he can bring some relief to his people in these camps by introducing some level of culture or art. Um, what happens to Noguchi in this camp isn't completely clear, but it would seem that after about two months, he wants out. Uh, there are various theories on this. One is that he realized quickly that he was not gonna be able to bring anything re re resembling art to this population. They were worried about basic survival. And after two months, he wants out, but he can't get out. And he becomes a prisoner himself and does not, he spends about another six months, six to seven months in this camp before he's finally released. When he gets out of the camp, he uh, does extensive worldwide traveling, which he's done earlier in his life as well. And when he finishes his travels and excursions, he returns to New York in the mid 1940s. And his second great collaboration with Mar Martha Graham is of course, uh, Appalachian Spring. This is a, a photograph of that original production. And again, we can see the brilliance, the originality of Noguchi's minimalist uh, set designs. Um, 
and again, this is one of these pieces that I think is, is, is timeless, uh, timeless piece of art. And Graham and Noguchi will go on to do numerous uh, collaborations, many collaborations together. Uh, for about 40 years, they worked together. So I'm going to jump here to 1946. This is a photograph taken of Noguchi with one of his abstract sculpt sculptures uh, carved out of marble slabs called Kronos. And it's taken this long for Noguchi to get recognition as a uh, important uh, modern sculptor in America. And in 1946, he's included in this show, important show, by the Museum of Modern Art. This is the original catalog cover from the show called 14 Americans. And this was one of these shows that MoMA did that was, they felt they picked artists, young, young, youngish artists or emerging artists that they felt were going to be major American artists. Uh, I think also in this show, I think uh, Robert Motherwell, uh, Arshul Gorky, I think even Saul Steinberg was, uh, featured in this group. And with this show, Noguchi realizes his, his first dream uh, that he had coming into New York to be an artist, and that's to be recognized as an important modern sculptor. And from this point on, he does have that status uh, combined with his, his achievements working with Graham. Um, again, after uh, a period in New York, by the early 1950s, he, Noguchi gets restless again. He starts going all over the world uh, to experience different cultures, soak them up, and put them back into his art. And he winds up back in Japan, and he becomes very interested in many of the traditional Japanese objects, everyday objects. And uh, of course, one of the things that he, he really is fascinated by um, are the traditional Japanese lanterns. And in 1951, his first series, official series that he calls um, light sculptures are released all over the world. And they become uh, immediately uh, part of the modern, uh, interior uh, and uh, part of the design world, modern design world, they're still popular today and still con considered contemporary. Um, one of the things that happens to Noguchi when he gets involved in uh, disciplines other than traditional sculpture is he loses a status, loses status with certain important New York critics, including Dora Ashton. And um, it kind of diminishes his, his reputation in places like the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, one of the things I have to say here real quickly about Noguchi, where he was, again, way ahead of his time, he did not see sculpture in a, in a narrow way that institutions like MoMA saw sculpture. He saw sculptural elements in everything. And he wanted to develop that concept of bringing sculptural elements, sculptural concepts uh, into everyday life so people could experience it in a more direct way. And that was part of his interest in furniture design, his lighting design. Um, one other development with Noguchi I wanted to just mention quickly is uh, he, um, Gets married in 1951, and uh, the movie star, Ishika Yamaguchi, and so I mentioned this for a couple of reasons. Uh, they were they were married in 1951, the same year he did the light sculptures. Uh, they married in Japan, and when he returned to New York, uh, he. Uh, had this ongoing battle to get citizenship, US citizenship for uh, Miss Yamaguchi. And he struggled for, I, I think they struggled for like 
six or seven years thinking that because of her status as a movie star, an actress, uh, and his status as an important American artist, that she would be given U.S. citizenship. They were never able to get her U.S. citizenship. She was never able to come to the United States. He would have to visit her <clears throat> in Japan, and apparently this was just too much for the marriage, and by 1958, they are divorced. And I'm just gonna end this chapter on Noguchi with this photograph of what uh, another vision that Noguchi had uh, from the 1960s on, he wanted to develop what he called playscapes. Uh, take traditional designs of playgrounds for children and come up with a more artistic, creative approach that he felt would serve a number of functions for children, including subliminally introducing them to, to design, to color, to design, to art, while they played. And it was really one of his uh, stronger uh, visions, uh, uh, goals, to have these, these playscapes built all over the world. Now, this is one of the, another uh, sad part of Noguchi's story, is that he tried for over two decades uh, submitting proposals, not only in Japan, but specifically in New York City. He did succeed in having one playscape built in Japan, I believe in the 1960s, but it was torn down after a short period, doesn't exist anymore. He uh, worked with Louis Kahn for a few years, developing various designs and proposals that were submitted to Robert Moses for development throughout the, the boroughs. And Moses didn't like them and rejected everything. He also submitted a proposal for a playscape outside of the new UN Plaza that was rejected. Everything he designed for New York was unfortunately rejected. And the only Noguchi playscape that exists now in the entire world is oddly enough in Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Georgia, where I had showed you that photograph taken by Ming Smith earlier in the talk. And this is a photograph of that playscape in Piedmont Park in Atlanta. It was built in the 1970s, I think the mid 1970s, and uh, it is uh, a pride of uh, uh, Atlantans and uh, the park. And it, they continue to uh, maintain this playscape and keep it in, in really good condition. So if you went online now, you could see photographs of uh, the playscape in uh, Piedmont Park still being highlighted as a tour destination. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go on to the, I'm gonna take a sip of water. I'm going to go on to the last chapter in the talk today, which is about these two men. On the left, we see a on the left we see a young student, T. C. Cannon, with these cowboy hat and sunglasses on. In the middle of the photograph, this gentleman is Fritz Shoulder, at the time T. C. Cannon's teacher. Uh, at the newly formed Institute for the American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico. The, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the, this is a very controversial chapter in American art history. The relationship between these two men, these two painters, uh, and their stories. And, Again, I want to point out that I'm going to try to present this as objectively as I can. And in order to do that, I'm going to try to present information chronologically uh, as it unfolded to the world. So this photograph, I'll just say quickly, taken in uh, around 1964 at this newly formed Institute for uh, Indian Arts. And uh, it was, I think, opened in 1963 uh, that f from a charter that was submitted by various uh, Native American tribes 
to the president, President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy at the time, and Kennedy approved the charter. So this was the first art school of its kind in America. And uh, Fritz Scholder was one of the first instructors hired to teach, and T.C. Cannon was part of the first group of students there. I'm gonna start with uh, just saying this. Up until really the 1960s, as we'll see as I go on with the story, up until the 1960s, in the world of fine art, in oil painting, interpretations of Native Americans looked something like this painting you're looking at. Um, they were always uh, uh, various, various stereotypes, noble savages or peaceful uh, people who were full of wisdom, patience, uh, or they were uh, warlike savages. Uh, but these were the stereotypes. This is what oil painting uh, with Native Americans as subjects by white or European painters looked like up until the 1960s. Here's, here's, another, these are, here's another painting I think I have here. Yeah. Both of these are by uh, Frederick Remington, who was one of the foremost American painters of the American West, where we get a lot of our imagery from. When I was growing up, these are the the images I had of uh, Native Americans, along with the images from movies and magazines, but everything was kind of in this uh, vein, in this language. Um, the other art that existed before 1960s regarding Native Americans was paintings like this. Um, <clears throat> that again, show this noble, peaceful kind of uh, figure. And um, that was about it. Very kind of almost provincial, traditional art. And it wasn't until 1967 that that all changed with this painting by Fritz Scholder. Um, a little background on Fritz Scholder. Uh, Shoulder was only one quarter Native American, and uh, he never presented himself as uh, an Indian. He was always an, outs an Indian and not an Indian at the same time, as he put it. So he approached the, his portraits of Native Americans as a, an outsider, even though he was partially Native American himself. And it, it, did, it did change everything uh, because he entered these portraits of Native Americans, these contemporary portraits of Native Americans with a critical eye that had never been done before. Now this painting uh, granted this first in his series of what he called the Real Indians series is awkward. And it's not a great painting. It's very self-conscious. It's very stiff. But this is where Shoulder, who had for many years, as an instructor to his students, including T.C. Cannon, had told them, I will never paint an Indian. I want to get way beyond that provincial approach to my culture. He really uh, had gone completely into abstract art, abstract landscapes. And when he did this, Portrait of an Indian, 1967, it really came as kind of a shock to everyone that he was suddenly painting Indians as his subject matter. Um, by the way, that painting was, let me just go back for one second. This painting was first shown in 1967 as part of a group show. Uh, he had studied with the great painter, still living contemporary painter, Wayne T. Bow. Um, and when they showed this, this uh, Holder, uh, Shoulder's first paintings, it got an immediate response from the art world and he was, his reputation was already starting. This is another painting from that series done a, a couple of years later. And I'm showing you this so you can see the controversy with these paintings. This is a painting by Shoulder of a re reservation Indian. Uh, hanging out at a bus station, a bus depot. 
And the implication here is that shoulder is showing us a different side of Native American culture, the reservation Indian, that often has been uh, in, a, in decline and is uh, wound up being unemployed, often alcoholic. And this is the Native American that shoulder is showing us. And uh, it's especially controversial to other Native Americans, and they hate these paintings. But again, they uh, get immediate recognition in the art world, and uh, he's, his reputation builds very quickly. Uh, this painting that he does as part of his original Real Indian series called Indian with a Beer Can is considered the, the, the groundbreaking painting. Uh, for American Indian art by many. And uh, here we see uh, this Bacon-esque uh, shoulder was very influenced by Francis Bacon and a number of European and American pop artists. And he gives us this terrifying, grotesque look uh, at a reservation Indian, a male, and who has obviously sunken into maybe alcoholism. And these paintings are just, just startling to, to the art world. Here's another one from this series. Uh, I think this is called uh, Walking to the Next Bar, done in the 1970s. And here, Scholler continues, endless paintings, portraits of these uh, reservation Indians that have uh, reached the state of hopelessness, really, uh, being a conquered people. Um, living under oppression on reservations. And, the, and one of the striking things that he does is that he's giving us this very serious theme uh, done in these pop colors. Uh, these are really pop art on many levels, and yet they have this serious subject matter. The combination is visually uh, arresting. Uh, and I, want, I think it's important to give you a sense of scale so here you can see two of uh, Shoulder's uh, real Indian paintings, uh, and you can see how, how big they are. Uh, Shoulder was working in the large format of the abstract expressionists and the pop artists. So these things are, are hard to ignore, these paintings, actually. And uh, just very interesting work. Again, there's a controversy behind all this, which I'm going to get into in a minute or so. Another iconic image that Shoulder took credit for is the American Indian wrapped in an American flag as this iconic symbol of the relationship between the two cultures. Uh, these, these paintings, again, become instantly popular, famous, um, are shown all over the world. Another one, uh, which is a very disturbing uh, portrait here. Uh, this is literally called Insane Indian, number 26, where again, Shoulder is trying to show us the devastation to Native Americans uh, after, after decades of living on reservation and that lifestyle of poverty. Uh, illiteracy, et cetera, et cetera. And yet they're done in these powerful pop cult colors and this large format. Uh, this one, I, I, actually, I actually like this painting a lot. It's called Matinee Cowboy and Indian, done in 1978. And here, Scholler again is giving us a very uh, critical look, but incorporating humor uh, in giving, throwing our stereotypes back to us from, from, from movies, from cinema. And this portrait here uh, is very, I think, very touching. One of his more touching, less acid uh, portraits. It's called uh, Indian and Storefront, 1974. Again, showing us uh, not a stereotype Indian, but uh, someone he's seen, he knows from his community. Uh, one of the things I want to say before I move on uh, to T.C. Cannon, uh, Shoulder did not want to be remembered as a 
um, Native American painter. He wanted to be remembered as an American painter, and he really believed that this series that he was doing, the subjects with the uh, reservation Indians, was not going to be all he did in his art career or all he would be known for. But that's how it turned out. Um, I'm going to end this, the uh, profile on shoulder with this painting, and it's literally called Indians Going Nowhere. And this was done in the 1990s. No, no, I'm sorry, early 1970s. And, tr you know, compare this to the Remingtons of the uh, warriors on horses. Compare this image, this stark image that Shoulder gives us, again, based on a Francis Bacon composition. But these Indian chiefs, braves, literally directionless uh, with no future. And uh, ag but again, done in these bright acid colors and large format was a look that uh, is still considered uh, revolutionary in uh, Native American painting. Um, but now for the second half of this story. This is a photograph of a young T.C. Cannon, who, as I said, was one of Shoulder's prize painting students at the uh, Institute in Santa Fe. And what Shoulder was trying to convince these young painters to do was to get away from their provincial instincts to paint pictures like the one behind T.C. Cannon at this moment and think modern. If you want to be part of the modern art world, you want to be successful, you've got to get it beyond this provincial, local view of art and, and expand your view. And students like TC, gifted students like TC Cannon fought that impulse. And unlike Shoulder, uh, TC Cannon, who was a full-blooded Native American, was very proud of his heritage and um, he wanted to show the dignity and pride of his people, even though they were suffering on reservations or in poverty. This painting, um, done by, uh, let me get the title of this for you. <clears throat> yeah, this painting done by uh, T.C. Cannon, which is typically called a uh, diner. Uh, the full title is Mama and Papa Have the Going Home to ship, ship Rock Blues. And the full title is inspired by a kind of Bob Dylan uh, lyric or line. Uh, T.C. Cannon was very aware and loved what was going on in the New York art scene in American culture, including Bob Dylan, a lot of the folk singers, folk music, rock music, uh, and the pop painters and, and post-pop painters like uh, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. And this painting that, um, now here's where the story gets interesting. This painting was done in, in 1966, a year before Shoulder's first American Indian uh, painting would be shown. Cannon was already doing paintings like this. And uh, part of the controversy in this story is that many believe that uh, Cannon was Shoulder's primary influence and uh, that Shoulder did not give Cannon credit. Many view this painting as the pivotal changing painting, uh, game changer in Native American uh, contemporary painting. It's also a large format painting. Uh, it's magnificent. I first saw this painting in person at the show at the National Museum in Manhattan uh, last year. Again, interestingly, uh, here we see uh, T.C. Cannon's painting of um, a reservation Indian, reservation male, at a bar, minus the beer can. And this painting also was done years before Shoulder would paint his uh, iconic uh, Indian with a beer can. And when you see this painting, it's, it's hard to uh, ignore how much shoulder may have been, uh, I'll, I'll be polite here and say sampling from T.C. Cannon. Um, shoulder was uh, 
never comfortable with being a Native American. His father had been a, was a half breed, and both uh, shoulders, father and shoulder, grew up going to public schools, Indian public schools, uh, in, in South Dakota, where they were basically taught to hate, despise their own culture, which is, there is tragedy to this story. And I, it's something that Shoulder must have wrestled with all of his life. Uh, this paint, this watercolor done um, by uh, T.C. Cannon in 1967, when Shoulder was starting to make his mark as an important new contemporary painter, uh, T.C. Cannon had enlisted to go to Vietnam, and he fought in the Tet Offensive as nothing less than a paratrooper uh, from 1967-1968. Um, and he was following the tradition of his Akwaya Indian uh, tradition to uh, be a warrior and fight for your country. And that's what he went in thinking he should do. Of course, during the war, he began to have conflicts and over fighting and other indigenous people. Uh, and it, it, it really seemed to uh, definitely damage him when he came back from the war. Um, he was not the same person, uh, it would seem. Um, so, yeah, let me just move on here. So this uh, wonderful painting here, uh, you can see the difference in T.C. Cannon's work and in um, and Shoulder's work, whereas T.C. Cannon's work is much more humanistic, and he is always trying to show the dignity and beauty of his people, even though they are suffering under horrendous conditions. Uh, he is going for that underlying dignity, uh, whereas Shoulder is going for the rage and the horror. This, uh, this painting is another wonderful painting that he did of, um, of a Native American chief that had visited Washington. This would happen often, that these chiefs would uh, travel all the way to DC from their tribes to try to get things for their people, the various charters, money, whatever they could get. And they would inevitably go home empty handed except for these token gifts they would be given. Uh, this is called Presidential Medal, Indian with a president, Presidential Medal. And you can see the medal that this chief is wearing. And I, I guess he's also, he was given a silk top hat. And I assume that's an American flag on his lap. Uh, not sure if this is where the expression going home with your hat in your hand, but we see the Capitol building in the background. And this is, again, painting a tragedy. This is a tragic story, a tragic scene, which had played out over and over and over again for Native Americans. And, but again, it's done in these bright pop colors. Um, and you can see the, the uh, influence of, of Cannon on shoulder through this work. And this last painting I'm gonna share with you by Cannon is of, um, a elderly woman on a reservation. And again, even though this woman is living in poverty and very extreme conditions, Cannon is painting the inner dignity and strength of this, of this woman. And that's the difference, I think one of the main differences between Cannon and Shoulder um, is their basic viewpoint on life and their, and their native cultures. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, Joan, if you want to start taking comments, questions, maybe we can start entertaining that. Yep. Um, okay. Okay. Wait, gotta take my mask off. People were coming in and out, so. Okay. In the in the aluminum Noguchi piece. Let me go back. To is the, it hollow? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, it is. Oh. Yep. It's aluminum cast. Yes. All right, so uh, we can take questions now. Um, yeah. Does everybody, I, uh, again, everybody don't... knows how to use the chat line, I assume, right, Joe? Yeah, I, I assume we've been doing it for all the library programs. 
So you can, um, there doesn't seem to be any other questions. <laughs> no questions. No questions. So um, this is all very good. Um, don't, there's somebody who raised their hand. Please okay. use the chat function. We, we don't use the other. Yeah. And it's at your bottom, the menu at your bottom, it says chat. Yeah, you just chat. type it in. Um, so we'll just wait a minute, moment or two. If not, Let's wait a few minutes, yeah. Um, and we'll just wait. Uh, actually, nobody's nobody's typing in. So I guess we'll go. It's been a long time. It's hard for people to sit this long, and I understand it. So Cliff, thank you so much for okay. your program. All right, Joe. You know, I have an, a painting of five American Indians. I'm so curious. And what was the name of the museum that you had? which um, this woman, Rosenberg. Oh, that's a uh, National Museum of the American Indian in Manhattan. Okay, that's what I needed to know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, Joe. All right, so thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.